103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is Sunday, April the 4th, 2021. I'm Larry Rhodes, or Daughter 5, and as usual, we have our co-host, Wombat, on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. Ay ay ay, Rangers, it's a big problem today! Ay ay ay! Uh, don't, uh, don't get it. <laughs> my my 90s friends will all understand oh, yeah, that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And also Ooh. with us today is Doubtfire, Boudreaux, and Brooklyn. Hello, Brooklyn. A uh, Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. Wombat, what do we have for a topic today? I think we're dot, 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 something about Skynet. I think that's what we're going to be talking about. Skynet. Yeah. But before we get into it, I want to do a quick little review. How's everyone doing since last week? We got a new holiday coming up. Weather is looking so great. Boudreaux, what's up? What's on your plate? We had our first summit since October by the campfire last night. Very, very, very nice. What was the crowd size? How, how did uh, it go? Just, just five of us. Uh, George Buffalo was there, and nice. Uh, a few others. It was, you know, we were distanced and sitting by the fire, and most of us, I think everyone was vaccinated. So yeah, uh, it was just, it was kind of nice. It was. It'll nice. be more and more common as we go yeah. along this year. Yeah you are slowly beginning to appreciate the value of like just that social interaction. Mm -hmm. And I got to be honest with you, since COVID has started, I've kind of gotten scarily comfortable with solitude. Mm. And I realized it's going to take more muscle to to break away from that and and start to really ingest myself into humanity again, because there is value there. And I highly recommend you try it. Scott, how you been since last week? What's up? Hey, doing good, man. Just, um, Doing the same things as usual, writing tracks and doing debates and going to work. Yeah, you're doing all sorts of stuff. (laughs) Not a lot of people say that. Not a lot of people are like, hey, I'm just making new music with like Grammy Award nominees. And, you know, I'm I'm, I'm doing some debates on uh, atheist Christianity, trying to ingest some good critical thought in the masses and then work. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. busy busy <laughs> you are busy and you're raising a family too you're doing it all my friend you're doing that's it all. right uh george how you been since last week what's up with you well i've been reminiscing about our last program our topic last week was um uh, reincarnation if i remember mm, right something like that and yeah, I, I, I had a mini tantrum on the air last week. So I realized what that was about was that having lived in the San Francisco area and San Francisco itself for 40 years, I was in the land of the nuts among the berries. And um, uh, some stuff was flooding back. I I developed a short fuse for cults. Mm. And um, uh, I was living a block and a half away from the seven-year-old guru Guru Maharaji, whose mother drove around in a chauffeured Rolls Royce, and um, uh, a friend of mine was uh, a follower of Jim Jones. Mm. And, you know, but we must the... forsake the pleasures of this world for the next. <laughs> exactly. Except he didn't go. He he uh, he never he he survived to tell the tale, wow. be- because there were a few people who did not go to Jonestown. What a boy to it. miss, right? Like, what a plan yeah, to be like, oh, your flight's delayed. Ah, oh, dang, I didn't get to Jonestown. Well, man, I'll, I'm sure I'll make it next week. <laughs> those, I'll tell you, man, those people were so confused when the press came down on them to find out what was going on. Mm. They, they had no idea. So anyway, I, I apologize for blowing it last week. No, I got a short tolerance for, and I'll admit this too, like when someone tells me things that are like a religious story, but it's like, straight out of the Bible, I have such a low tolerance for that because I've heard those stories a thousand times. I've spent my entire life debunking them, debating against them, and realizing conversational techniques to get other people to realize that they're bunked too. And then when someone says, well, here's something I heard from the Quran, I'm like, oh, tell me about the Quran. I'm really interested in this. (laughs) (laughs) The Torah, I'm really, I want it. It's the same thing I'm not going to maybe take as seriously by default, 
but at least it's new and i i will take a new flavor of of of, of coke than the the plain old version <laughs> well the, i uh, was having to i was having to fight my way through the moonies to get mm. from one building to another at the college where i worked you know it yeah. was it, it it didn't stop it doesn't stop in san I'm, francisco i know? am interested if you call san francisco the the nuts among berries what's oakland but we'll get into that later larry how you been what's up with you <laughs> Um, I've been doing fine, staying in, staying safe as usual. Nice. Uh, I'm not working. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a 71st birthday next year, <gasps> and so I'm getting up up there a little bit. However, I am looking forward to getting my motorcycle out probably nice. within the next week or so. I've got an oil change scheduled. I'm looking forward to getting some time in maybe at an Ask an Atheist booth starting in the spring here shortly. Nice. Yeah. So things to look forward to. Nice. Hey, quick question. Can't you do your oil change on a motorcycle yourself? Uh, not to challenge you on the, on the spot, but like what's going on there? You have access. Well, my bike weighs 700 pounds. And, but you're, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a two wheel thing. You can get under it. You can get on top of it. You can get on yeah. both sides. What, what's, what's the mechanic doing that you can't? I think my oil change days are over. I'm going to have it done. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget the, the, the best part of the oil change is you have to clean up the mess afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like at this point, it's like the sort of thing where you find a neighbor kid and give him five bucks and be like, Hey kid, shovel my, my paveway and change uh -huh. my oil. Used to be able to do that back in the day. Oh, mm -hmm. anyway, guys, wouldn't it be nice if you could have a machine change your oil for you? Wouldn't that be great? And like, mean, like an artificial of... intelligence. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That'd be nice. Though I don't want to get into a whole conversation about AI unless if we talk about what we mean by AI, cause I know George would like that. Uh, Boudreau, I'm going to start with you first. Give me your whole rundown on AI. What do you think it is? What does it mean to you? Well, I mean, kind of in the research world, AI is getting a lot of prominence because we're basically able to, you know, feed a bunch of data to a computer and have it kind of spit out an answer that we never really actually give it the instructions on what to do. It just finds patterns and things like that. So I think that's kind of maybe the, the softer side of, of what, what we mean, but, mm. uh, I think the cooler side would be kind of what you hinted at, um, having a, having a robot, you know, having a, a artificial intelligence that, that, that can may basically think and, 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 uh, uh, do things and, and actually kind of seem like it's conscience conscious. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe we enter the, the soul in there somewhere, but yeah. Like, can we build something that, that is aware yeah, I want to touch on that just a little bit. So what do you mean by inject the soul? What what would we use as a target to know if we're actually injecting a soul into AI? That, uh, that would be, I think that that would be the burden for the religious people to to tell us because if 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 we're eventually in a point where we we have a, 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 an android basically something walking around that that thinks it's aware, passes the Turing test, all of this, then does this thing have a soul? You know, uh, I don't, I, mean, I don't think so, but well, could, hold could on a argue? Second. so like, as we define soul as like something that carries on after we die, if we can, the thing is we have difficulty measuring those sort of things, but with a sure. AI or a computer, these could be much more tangible things to measure the tech and, and so on. And so if an AI comes to you and says, Hey, I actually do have a soul. You can destroy this body. You can destroy these chipsets. And this carries on these bit, this information set will carry on. Like you can't mm. destroy a, 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 how do I put it? Like a picture or a meme on the internet. Like that's just infested the entire internet, Fair. right? Like where, what does the Fox say? Or the, the never going to give you up song. Like that's not right. going away anymore. That's part of us. <laughs> that's the soul of the internet. <laughs> right. right. What would you say then? Like, okay, maybe they do have a soul. Like at least in the electronic sense. Yeah, that counts. We don't, but they do. And does, what, what are the ramifications of that? Sorry. Sorry for being. I don't know that that's so, I mean, if, if it lives on, I mean, couldn't you reincarnate it then into another machine body? Larry, Larry. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute, buddy. Thank you. Uh, the thing about it is I don't believe this machine has a soul. Right. So you're talking really consciousness. We're getting into equivalency here. Okay. Uh, we have a problem with that. <clears throat> I had a, pro a conversation with a person on Facebook this, this morning mm. about um, 
the mind. And he was he was giving the mind all of the attributes that a supernatural person or a person who believes in the supernatural would give to a soul. Mm. In other words, he believed, you know, just calling it a mind means that it has uh, eternal life. Mm. And to me, a mind is something that is produced by a living brain. Yeah, physical. So, you know, thing. what are we talking about when we're talking about soul? Are we, are we really referring to consciousness? Good points. Good points. Larry, since you got the mic, what do you, how would you define AI then? What, what would it mean to you? And if an AI said, hey, I do have a soul, what well, kind of would you Well, yeah, I, I don't think he's going to have a soul any more than I would, but he might have consciousness or it might have consciousness. Um, mm-hmm. I think that we're rapidly approaching that point in artificial intelligence when, um, well, I think we've already passed the point where a Turing test has been, uh, yes. uh, you know, passed. We In have. other words, a Turing, a Turing test is sitting down some somebody at a keyboard and letting them talk to an AI and trying to determine whether or not they're a real person or not. Correct. If they cannot determine if it's a real person or not, then the AI has passed the Turing test. Right. Um, I think that we're well past that and we're on our way to artificial intelligence. I mean, consciousness in the machine, but who knows when that'll happen. Uh, I think it would happen in the next 50 years for sure, but maybe a lot closer than that. Yeah, I see it too. I th- I also see where you're drawing the line where it's like, hey, just because something says it has a soul doesn't mean it has a soul. If you just really mean it's conscious after its physical body dies, that may not even be a soul. You still have to define what a soul is or, or come into a better use because at this point, you're just making equal consciousness, which is well, In the term not of the AI, thing. the yeah. physical body would be the machine it's running on. Right. right I mean, without right. a machine, it's still going to get more. A network is a bunch of machines. Yep. But without that, would it continue to exist? I say no. Mm. Scott, got some my questions for you. You know, I, I know you've gone to some yogis. I know you've probably, you know, like really, really meditated on this. What, what is the essence of AI? And when, and when, in your opinion, do we start saying, hey, that's just a really smart computer too? Actually, that is artificial intelligence. Right. So you can think of like with with us humans, have you ever heard, have you, or you've ever heard anyone say, man, I just can't stand myself right now. I can't stand myself. Well, who is the I and who is the self that the I can't stand? So there's this, there's these two objects inside your mind that's at play. And so if you're involved in thinking like a machine can think a machine can go through algorithms and perform, you know, computations. So if we're involved in our thinking and our thinking is like worrying or being anxious or being happy or, you know, the whole other side of it, you're, you are the thinking you're involved in the thinking. And sometimes the thinking is a form of distress or anxiety, Hmm. but then people who get out of it, have this metacognition where they say, I can't stand my thinking. So I'm observing my thinking. I'm observing myself thinking, which is kind of a weird thing. If you, it's like a hall of mirrors, it's, it's like a lucid moment. It goes on infinitely. Yeah. If you think about it. So there's this aspect of, of consciousness where we're able to sort of transcend our thinking and kind of split, make this sort of split. And I think that's where, the religious idea of the soul comes in. Like there's this soul that observes the thinking and observes the doing and observes the being. And then there's this soul thing, which is just the being itself an experience. So if you think of AI, Hmm. if AI could do this, then you would say that this is a conscious being itself because it can actually you are into IT. Larry, you've done IT as well. I know, Boudreaux, you've probably played around some computers. George raising his hand. We know that there are core functions on a computer, and then there's like the, the higher level functions or even higher, higher level functions that are waiting for user interfaces. So like mm-hmm. if I have a, a joypad, I'm pushing in buttons on that joypad, but the joypad's not controlling the CPU or the GPU. That's, that is a core function on like a computer or a, 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 a video game console. And so there are stack levels of of operating systems Mm -hmm. even on a computer and and some may not even be aware of what the other thing's doing and that's leads to latency and all a bunch of different stuff so like if you're saying like having different stacks of thinking 
constitutes consciousness and therefore as a sign of, of artificial intelligence, would you not argue then that like, I don't know, a PlayStation 5 is intelligent? <laughs> artificial right. intelligence? So, so there's a difference between intelligence and um, consciousness. So consciousness is non-functional, whereas intelligence is functional. Intelligence does something. It's it's an algorithm. It's it's um, it's processing information, whereas consciousness is non-functional. It's just kind of neutral. It's there observing the function. It's there feeling the function. It's there. It's embedded in the function. It can even transcend the function and look at it and observe it. So there's a little bit of a difference. So you could say like, you know, when we look at say an ant colony. Mm -hmm. An ant colony is doing a function. It seems to be acting intelligently. It's foraging for food. It's making routes. It's building bridges. It's doing all this cool stuff. But is it really conscious? Yeah. I don't know if it's really conscious or not because think about it. There's also these these um, death spirals that ants go through. If, if ants follow a certain thing and they just follow the scent and it happens to wrap them around a tree, they'll just march around the tree forever and they'll just die. <laughs> so there's no real conscious. Um, well, I mean, humans get caught in circular loops as well. And mental yeah. illness, uh, it, you know, it has a lot of that in it. Alcoholism. And, uh, right. Yep, that's so, correct. And you could say that the, that's part of consciousness. Yeah. So it's not the, an more argument. Conscious, the more conscious you are, the more you're able to escape out of that problem. Oh, because... that's a dangerous thing. Or I can hear a lot of people getting upset if they heard something like that. I can think like, I can say that I could consciously be trapped in alcoholism and I know it's a problem and I know I can't get out of it and I would have to seek help too. And maybe I'm successful or not, but I'm conscious through that entire route. I think people who might be trapped in like homelessness, mental illness, they're, they are consciously suffering aware. even if they can't even get out of it or it could be that they're not really aware they're not conscious or aware in that sense of their situation like um a mentally ill person probably doesn't think that they're mentally ill when they hear voices they probably think they're really hearing voices and so they're caught up in their thinking because they're they're they are their thinking but they are Whereas if they were a little more aware or conscious of what's going on, they could expand out of that and maybe transcend it. And maybe that's where the healthiness comes in is when we expand our consciousness out to have a bigger perspective. Well, maybe I'm not an expert, of course, but we might want to inject the concept of agency at this point. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can say that a computer has, you know, a functioning, um, AI and it, but does it have agency or is it anything that it wants? And it, and if not, can we call it conscious? Yeah, uh, Scott, I appreciate you going out on this branch. We'll come back to this because I do want to hear what everyone says about AI. But consider like the idea of how can we objectively <laughs> measure consciousness and is ability to get out of bad places in life a, a a good measuring stick for something that could be as elusive as consciousness something to consider george i got a question for you have you ever been a cyborg have you ever been a robot have you ever you know saw that star trek episode where kirk fell in love with a robot and you're like i wish i can have that too that's just a beautiful relationship you know i don't remember i don't remember that episode i i did enjoy the series very i'm just much. trying to trigger Boudreaux. i'm trying to mention star trek at every opportunity oh that's good <laughs> I, Sam love, Harris. I do Sam love Harris. star trek. yeah <laughs> i love star trek well what are you asking me <laughs> oh hey what's AI? It what's AI to you what's AI to you what? all right hey i you know come, i uh, have experience working with um, real musical instruments. Yep. And oh yeah, people have been attempting to try to make uh, artificial musical instruments out of electronics for an awfully long time. Correct. And um, to a person who understands, has enough exposure with real acoustical instruments, mm. can they tell the difference? Can a person? Uh, a human being interacting with artificial intelligence understand when the subtle cues are missing. Mm. And in a conversation with a machine, for instance, in, 
so in the world of musical instruments, the instruments that we know and love so much, the acoustical instruments, have defects in them. And it's the defects that give them their character. And the defects are changing all the time. And that's the part that is so difficult to capture artificially. Mm. It is the constantly changing, the morphing aspects of, of those defects, the defects which give them their character, their personalities. Sure. I totally hear you. Do you, you know, and, getting... and so to, to, to create the randomness of those aspects yeah. has been extremely difficult. And I won't go on at, at length about this. But... Difficult or impossible, George? What do you, what are, what are you making a distinction there? Well, you know, it's an I don't know thing. I think okay. I'm, I'm, I'm in the land of Larry's intelligence <laughs> right now, I think, because it, just because I don't think it's possible doesn't mean that anybody will, ne will never achieve it. Right. I, it's the, this is the, the big I don't know of it. So I can tell you right now, I have, um, I had a little toy piano keyboard when I was kid, well, growing up. It only had like 10 keys. When you hit a button, it didn't sound anything like a piano. But then as I got older, they came out with like Yamahas, Casio came out with new models, Core came into the scene with like really, really nice stuff. And I remember hearing like uh, Kaya 54, one of my favorite like jazz, salsa jazz ensembles play live on YouTube. And I watched them and like the piano that I knew note for note this entire solo was done on an electronic chord. And I was like, whoa, and I'm listening to it and it's imitating the hammer sounds it's imitating mm -hmm. the the wooden box inside the electronic keyboard and, and now putting it out loud and i'm like my whole life i thought that was a real piano it's like no because he needs to change and tune and do a bunch of cool stuff on it and i'm like i wonder if that's how people felt when they first saw an electric guitar right like that's just going into you know uh uh what do you call it Not, there's a, yeah there's a chip inside the, the guitar that helps to like modulate information as it goes out into a speaker like a lot of the sounds that we are developing for instruments are also evolving as well. And I feel like more and more computers are becoming a part of that to the point where George, I'd like to get your opinion on this. They now have AI conductors or AI composers, songs mm -hmm. that are composed entirely by computers. Have you heard any of this music before? I have, in fact, um, you know, the, uh, you will hear, hear from, hear me from time to time mention, the composer Johann Sebastian Bach, who is yeah. regarded by most music or cl classically trained musicians as the, the greatest ever, uh, as a contrapuntalist, the man who could compose uh, six simultaneous musical lines that have perfect harmonic relationships <clears throat> with each other at any instant during the piece. Yep. This is now. So it was like a mathematical relationship that he was really in tune to. Like, yeah. Now do you people feel like artificial have, intelligence can capture that. Well, it can. Hmm. And Bach has defects in his method, you see, and, and it's again, it's the randomness of these things that is so hard for AI to catch, you know. But um, having said that, yes, uh, computers have been able to be programmed to reproduce a composition in the style of Bach that is convincing to musicians. Wow, very cool. And even further, uh, scientists have created a piano playing program that can play the piano the way Glenn Gould did in 1957 when he recorded Bach's Goldberg Variations. So then here's my... Here's but my... the machine is playing a piano but here's my bottom line. <laughs> the piano's got the defects. It, for defects or not, in your opinion, can it ever get to the point where you're convinced that an AI that develops or composes a brand new piece of music, not trying to Im imitate any other previous composer in the past, would that be a sign of consciousness for you? Would that be, wow, this is so inspired that this can't just be, you know, a calculator on the shelf. This is it would be a, a higher level of, I don't know. A higher level of, I don't know. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, what's his name? Lieutenant Colonel Data? Is that, we're talking about Star Trek again? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're still wondering about Data, aren't we? Wow. So somehow... I'll still be, I, I won't be alive anymore. I will still be, my consciousness will still be wondering. Sure, sure. If that guy standing in front of my grave is it, is, is it a robot or a person? Say, say that yeah. wasn't the case. Say we figured out a way to keep you alive and you cried during a piece made by an AI. Would that make you feel like you, you were, that was a special moment? Like, Hey, I'm in. It, it would, it would. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Because I have to live with paradox, of course. Wow. Cool. Pujo, what do you got? But does that, uh, I heard your question earlier was, does that imply consciousness though? Yeah. Like to me, it seems like it, it, all we're doing is really, mathematically modeling you know genius mm. which which maybe is what bach was you know doing subconsciously or or you know maybe even consciously but um finding these patterns and putting them together it sounds good and pleasing but you know there's a reason for it mathematically perhaps and so i don't know that, that consciousness enters in i mean it's it's more like the answer to the question of what it is like to be yeah. that thing is, is to me the, the consciousness yeah. question. Can I weigh uh, in? Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry. I'll, I'll just weigh in. I think just my three cents on this uh, is I think consciousness is a little overrated. <laughs> and I mean that in the nicest way possible. I think what I really care more about are things that I can tangibly measure, which are consent and harm. And so if there is a being that is at least to me demonstrating that it is offering consent. And when I don't offer that consent, it's being harmed. I'm like, Hey, I can't measure your consciousness, but I can help to reduce a little bit of harm in the universe. And I can understand that you're offering me consent on how to treat you and how not to treat you. And like, how can we can be in a better relationship with each other? And I'm willing to work on those two standards way more than any ambiguous term of consciousness. So like, if there's a robot that's like, Hey, I made a really nice song. It'll make you cry. I'll be like, Oh shoot. Can I listen to it? It's like, yeah, please listen to it. I'll listen to it. And I'll be like, that was a great song. I'm not going to unplug you from the wall. <laughs> it was really good. I really like it. I'm not going to cause you arm and i'll appreciate your consent uh if you told me not to unplug you i won't unplug you. you you're i can't measure your consciousness but i don't want to harm you like you're clearly doing some good and so like i in my head i can work with those two in the best way that i can with the tools that we have available yeah it gets complicated yeah it gets a little messy but i think it's less messy than trying to establish a measuring stick for consciousness i think that's a very very hard thing to obtain uh yeah. consent harm that's my opinion that's my two cents scott what do you think before we head out yeah i, I was man I, you were right on track with me because i was about to say that um this is why they call it the hard problem of consciousness like mm -hmm. david chalmers made it real popular uh the hard problem of consciousness and it leads people and i think it's led you to be what they call a type one physicalist which is someone who just the way they deal with the hard problem is to say well the hard problem is an illusion. There is no hard problem. Basically, you're conscious, and that's the end of it. And what is there to figure out? You know, but then there's more, there's people that will maybe become a type three physicalist that would say, well, in the future, we're going to find out some physics is going to point to this is where, why consciousness happens. This is how we can predict matter will eventually become conscious at this particular point. And some people take the dualist view or whatever. Either way, none of it really solves the problem. It's just kind of like a, a placeholder for now. I think it's still the hard problem of consciousness. And this is the problem with AI, trying to pinpoint if when is the AI conscious. Because let, let's face it, if physics had all the answers right now, if physics knew and could predict how consciousness emerges, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We'd already have computers that could be conscious. The fact that we don't and can't, it's all just a big guessing game. We're just kind of like, you know, it's kind of like, um, I can't, I can't prove that you're conscious really. If I really think about it, I, you right. know, this could be Descartes demon. I could just be in a brain in a vat. And all you guys are just figments of the cosmic mind's imagination or solipsism or whatever you might. These things are have not been solved. And so I think that's kind of a weird thing. So 
in a way, it kind of leads me to a type one physicalist view too, that who cares, you know, if the, if the robot can tell me, Hey, don't do this. It feels bad. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to do it because I just have this brute fact about myself that I don't want to cause harm. Larry weigh in on this. Well, and one of the things I was thinking about when he was talking about it was, um, we were, we were talking earlier about injecting consciousness into a machine. Right. I think the way that you'd have to do that is you'd have to get it to realize that uh, it is an I. We were talking about I and me and and agency and all that. But how how would you tell us a piece of software to have awareness of its surrounding and be able to make choices on its own? Of course, that's a question for people who program AI and uh, have never done that. I'd really be interested in finding out more about it. Hmm. Oh. But I think injecting the eye into a machine would be the thing uh, to overcome to, right. to actually get done. Larry, we're at the bottom of the half hour. Yep. Then we need to take a short break. Uh, this has been the Digital Free Thought the first half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we'll be right back after this short break. 103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Hello and welcome back to the Digital Free Thought Radio, our second half. I'm Dr. Five and we're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today, Sunday, April 4th, 2021. Uh, let's talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. They're founded in 2002. We're in our 19th year now. We have over a thousand members and we have weekly Zoom meetings soon to start up with the regular uh, on-site meetings down at Barley's Tavern. From your pizzeria. I hope to find you there too when we start back. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start, start one. one. Where do you want to pick up on this AI stuff there, Wombat? I want everybody to give me a F A N M A I M A I L. Do it. F A N M A I L. Thank you. That's fan mail. Yeah. What a fan. What a fan. Yeah. What a fan. What a well mighty done. good fan. Well done, guys. What a fan. Come on, guys. What a fan. What a fan. What a fan. What a mighty good fan. What a mighty good fan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We got a really good question from Data's Trading Room last week on last week's episode, which was Let's Talk Karma. Last week, we were talking all about karma, but we missed an important question that Dadas brought up. He said, hey, you guys missed an important question. How can you test karma? And I was no. like, I can't believe we talked about karma for like an hour, plus some extra time, plus change, and we didn't even talk about, well, how can you even test for karma? And I think that's a really great question. Like, That's a good question. It's a very good question. And so I'm going to, instead of putting people on the hot seat, I'll throw out mine and then I'll just go around the same order before. But I think a good test for karma, a good test for karma is very elusive. Um, you could, for example, how about this? What do you guys think about this? You could say, hey, uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to have two groups of people. One group will do something bad and it'll be the same thing. The other group will not do that thing, right? And I'm just gonna let these two populations exist and do what they need to do. And we will track how long it takes for the same action that is bad to be punished by the universe among this group of people. And is it all the same severity and does it happen all at the same time? And if not, that can give me a variance for karma. And then if it's the same variance of things that happened in the group that didn't do anything, I can say that's a claim that there's no significant difference between the two groups and that there's no existence of karma. I know that's a weird statistical thing. I'm taking six Sigma classes. <laughs> in, my head, in my head, I'm calling that like an ANOVA uh, study with a Fisher number of 0 0.1. But <laughs> but what do you guys think of that? What would you do to improve the test? Pooja, I'll throw it at you. You're a statistics guy. How could you test for karma? Yeah, well, I mean, so um, we're, we're making the assumption we're talking about instant karma, right? Mm -hmm. So not, or, not karma that affects you. I'm hoping like life. karma within the, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Within yeah. this lifetime karma, because that would, yeah. that would be too impossible, dude. Well, because I, I kind of feel like that there aren't any real religious people that believe in instant karma. I think that's just something we kind of invented because it seems like a good idea. I but think we talked about like, that on last week's show, but at least yeah. for the sake of the question that. Okay, asked, sure. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I, the only problem I see with it is like, what's the, what's the timeline on how, how long is it going to take for that karma to kick in? 
Mm. Is it years? Is it months? Hours? Um, and I mean, you're gonna have these people in a isolated, I'm not putting holes in your argument. I'm just saying, I could see somebody saying, Oh no, no, no. It, it, it's going to affect their, you know, I'm their all about adulthood. Those. Let's just make the argument that it could be a test for, see if it happens within the week. If it, happens, okay, if it doesn't happen within the week, then we can say karma doesn't happen within the week. Yeah. That's whether if it's instant or not, it doesn't happen within a week. So you're fine within that week. I think I like it. I mean, it'd be it would be great if you could do twin studies. You know, ah, oh, there you go. But, yeah, like how they do with uh, the astronauts. I like that. Yeah. Uh, Scott, do you got a way you'd weigh in? How would you test for karma? Do you have a, for this life um, within a certain time frame? Doesn't matter what the time frame is. Yeah, I mean, it. You could. I don't know. So the way that I look at karma, I guess, or that I understand karma. Don't do this. Is it? it if, if you just think a of fan response. certain thoughts, if you act a certain on certain thoughts, you, you know how they say you put bad energy out into the universe, it'll come back to you. Yeah, do this, I don't do this. That, I mean, that seems to be true, whether karma is true or not. Hmm. If that makes sense, does that even make sense? No, I think I get you. Like the vibes are out there regardless, and so like, like if you we just throw your we test, just, you're just measuring vibes. Yeah, you're just measuring the natural world. I mean, if I do certain things, certain things are going to, I mean, it's cause and effect, right? So, I yeah, mean, so we have a that's going to happen test. regardless. So, yeah. does that really test anything? I mean, yeah. I don't know what we're testing. Okay, fair enough. Larry, do you have a way that you could test for karma? Yeah, I was Supernatural just karma. thinking about that. Um, well, the thing about doing tests is you, you do the test, you gather data. Right. You look at the data and you make a decision. Mm. Uh, the thing about it is I don't think we have to do any new tests. We have many um, examples and a lot of data in our history mm. or in the history of the world. Look mm. at Stalin, Hitler, Jesus, Gandhi. Trump. Uh, you know, and, and look at what happened to them, how they lived, lived their life, and what were the rewards, that type of thing. And I think if you look at it, you could see that karma is not a real thing. Sure. Bad things happen to good people, and sometimes nothing happen bad, bad happens to bad things. People. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. George, you want to capstone this conversation on karma? If Reverend you? Moon were to return from wherever he went what would he return as if who reverend sun myung moon who is this person help me out remember oh, early yeah remember earlier i said i had to fight my way through the moonies the mo uh, oh is he the J jamestown related Jill no 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 not he's jamestown he's a different the, guy okay reverend sun guy. myung moon there's a you can say the name but i still don't know <laughs> he was he, he was slower. the instigator yes, just say it slower come on it'll kick in he's eventually the, the moonies yeah, the leader sun of yun moon oh, <laughs> do, do, a, do, a, do google i it. get it now <laughs> all right <laughs> sun myung moon Got it. That's Got his it. name. Nope, lost it. Lost it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if, well, I'm 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 I, I'm looking at this as a reincarnation thing, I guess. <laughs> Any of those people who Larry mentioned, plus I'm adding this guy to them. If if the Reverend Sun Myung Moon mm. came back, mm. what would he return as? Okay. I don't know. What would his karmic Reincarnation. We would have be to figure what? that out. What yeah. we can track. Yeah, I have. Well, but we're really just test. talking about karma, not so much reincarnation. I know. But I mean, yeah. I guess you could look at it that way. So, and anyway, our takeaway: it's hard to measure it. We can come up with tests, but are we actually testing karma, or are we just testing world stuff that already exists? And why do we have to do tests at all? It seems like we have plenty of experience in the past, seen to tell to know that bad things happen to good people, and sometimes nothing bad happens to bad people. I think we got a good answer with all of us. Let's go to hot topics, guys. We put some questions down about AI. Uh, I want to do this first quick. Boudreaux, you're on the hot seat. If uh, your daughter came to you and said, Hey, you know, it's the year 2035, dad, my dad, my, my husband's my cell phone. <laughs> I downloaded the husband app. <laughs> I have this beautiful artificial intelligence. It knows entirely me. I can talk to this being forever and ever and ever. It knows exactly what I want. It has a job. <laughs> it could support me. And we're going to, we're going to get this new body from Amazon pretty soon. Like it's going to, we're just going to download it into the, the chipset of this robot body and it'll be your new son-in-law. Like, like, this is what everyone's doing, Dad. Stop freaking out. Why would you take that? Uh, you know, I think I would probably mirror how I would feel if if she came and told me she was going to marry a female, uh, and it would be, "Are you happy? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Sweet. Uh, you know, that's what Good love dad. is. Right? Good dad. Good dad. Good dad. I would be like, is it Apple or? <laughs> it better not be Google. It better not be Google. Google knows way too much about me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Scott, let me ask you this. You're on the hot seat next. That was a great answer, Boudreau. Uh, would you ever, okay, it's the year 2050. Would you, uh, courts have been greatly optimized through the use of AI-based judges mm -hmm. who aren't impartial based on your color or your social economic class, but they are AI. It is a big black tower in a, in a wig <clears throat> and a gown, right? Like, we, and you have the option, you, it's not forced. You have the option of going the, the human route to, to resolve a trial that you somehow found yourself in that you're innocent or going for an artificial intelligence to decide your case with like basically no jury because it, it is a perfect AI system that knows all the statutes and limitations. It has access to the information and it can do a probability test to see whether or not you're guilty or not. Which would you rather I, do? I don't know if I, if I could study the, um, the uh, success rate, like a track record of mm -hmm. the artificial intelligent program versus the human, then it would depend on the evidence. So it's kind of like driving cars, like self-driving cars. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I'd hop in one right now, but if maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 years down the line from now, everybody's doing it and there's not that many car accidents. Sure. Why not? I mean, I think it's the same problem we had with every new invention. Like we wouldn't get on an airplane because we're not meant to fly. So why would anybody in their right mind trust an airplane? But now we all take airplanes because it's just sure. it's what we do. Well, then let me throw this out at you. World. Let's put you on the other side. And George, I see you got a question coming up. But uh, if you had had a prominent murder, if you saw on TV a prominent murder case got uh, resolved with a not guilty for the first guy to be taken off the hook, by an AI judge, would you still think that guy was guilty because he didn't go through the human process? Or in your head, would you think, oh no, an AI figured it out. Maybe the AI knew what it was doing. Yeah, like, like right now, I would be very suspicious. Like mm -hmm. right now, you're just coming at me right now with it. Yeah, you're on the hot Because I have no experience with such things. Like these things are kind of fantasy land to me. So I wouldn't trust it at all mm -hmm. right off the bat. But given enough information and data, maybe I could, I would see it differently. I'm sure. Okay. But okay. Cool. George, what do you got? Well, I I want to bring up Doctor Who at this point. Okay. Uh, a doc Doctor Who. Who's which one? Um, <laughs> well, in this case, it's the fourth Doctor. It is um, uh, Tom Baker back in the 1960s, I believe, and I believe the episode. The story's name is Stones of Blood. Okay. And I want to recommend that we all watch this if possible, because there is a sequence in this delightful story where the doctor finds himself on a spaceship, a prison spaceship, facing a court of robots, um, a judge, a jury, and an executioner. And they become um, lawyers arguing ab among each other. These artificial consciousnesses are, are arguing whether he's guilty or innocent. And these are, these are beings which are floating in the middle of the air. It's, it's a wonderful sequence. And, and I recommend that we all watch this <laughs> if, if possible. Because I think it's a lot of fun. Nice. Pretty cool. Um, the answer is no. <laughs> I, want to put you, I want to put you on the hot seat right now. Would okay, give ever, it a try. Say you were just in the future and, and you're yeah. still good, but you're a little sick. In fact, you have to get a surgery done. Now, you can get a human surgery done or you can get the AI robotic surgery done. And, and, and I will tell you this. The robot has done this surgery many, many times before, just as many times as the human who's done it. And it's up to you to decide whether you want to have a human in there fooling around or if you want to have a robot in there fooling around. Uh, they both cost the same. What, right now, how do you feel like you would sway towards them? Do you feel, ever feel uh, like you'd be okay with the AI version? Um, it depends whether the doctor is drunk or not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd I, I go, I go for the AI if the doctor was drunk. Okay. 
and I would not go for the AI if the doctor was sober and I really trusted the guy. You know, okay. you would still I have go- to have comp. Yeah. I have to have confidence in the in the human doctor. Hmm. <clears throat> um, for one thing, maybe the human doctor will notice that there's a little bit of arthritic outgrowth in there while he's at it, and maybe we'll touch that up. Um, would the AI doc surgeon do that? Probably not. Oh, no. okay, okay, okay. Well, what What about the AI that, that can read um, medical scans and see so many more shades of gray that they're basically putting doctors out of the business? Because they, they and that's got can't, to- yeah. Yeah, so I mean, what, in fact, yeah. that, that's got something going for it too. Sure. sure. Yeah. I think, you know, in that kind of situation, I'd love to have the best of both worlds. I'd love to have a, a AI and a doctor in the room, sort of like pilot, co pilot sort of a situation. And like maybe can gradient from man doing or woman or human doing the work and then a robot being like, hey, I see some cool things on the side. You might want to check these out to, hey, it's an it's a operator or a technician in the room helping the AI be like, hey, is, is this look a little green to you? And then the, AI, the technician be like, yeah, yeah, we should probably take that out too. <laughs> Scott, what do you got? I saw a funny uh, video a uh, couple months ago about AI researchers that were asking the same question, like, can we trust AI to do things better than humans? Like, will they figure things out quicker and stuff like that? And yeah. the answer is like, in principle, yeah, but in practice, not really like in practice, like they said, like an AI could figure out how can we land this airplane at this destination the fastest so that the AI, AI figured out really quick, but it ended up crashing the plane because getting there quicker required the plane to just go descent straight down into the destination and crash and blow itself up. So it was right. It made the right decision based on your question. Yeah, it's but an it input output. Not, yeah, it that's didn't, not bad it, AI. That's just a poorly formatted question that was fake. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's only gonna consider, you know, your question is gonna be very rigorous and it's yeah. um, you know, so you have to watch that kind of stuff. Like, are we making sure we're doing that? Larry, what do you got? Okay, a lot of things came to mind when sure. this when this came up. Uh, first of all, I, I'd have to think about: Am I guilty? <laughs> oh, you're talking about if the I'm, law. You're talking about the law. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the judge. The, the, you oh, know, if judge. I'm guilty and I know it, I might choose a human judge because he may overlook oh! something. <laughs> Larry, that's uh, an interesting also, take. Hot take. Hot take. Hot take. Also, uh, then everyone knows. Was, like he chose the human judge because he's trying to get away with uh, it. Oh, mm-hmm. the AI judge. We all know it's better. If the if I knew that the the judge was the human judge was a real hardcore Christian, mm. uh, it, it may make a difference. It, it yeah. also make a difference if I knew that the pro the the program program judge the ai judge was programmed with biblical knowledge and and told it was all true (laughs) you know there's so many things there also as a human if uh if let's say i'm white and i'm and i'm banking on uh, the white privilege as sure. it were sure, i'd sure, definitely sure. choose a white judge if it was mm. something that might be impacted on that yeah. there's so many questions uh going into this that we it's hard to just say what if one's a human one's an ai um if, if i just those two choices and everything is equal yeah and i wasn't guilty I'd go with the AI. <laughs> yeah, I feel like AI might be the way how we might be doing this in the future. And I think there's going to be a lot of lobbying against it as we move our way towards it. But small crimes, you know, petty disputes, uh, uh, just good intermediary groups. I think ARs are going to weed their way into that eventually, where it's just, hey, click these buttons. You can settle it out. Divorce, we can figure that out. Boom. And then it's like child custody. Okay, robots can take care of this. They can figure out who makes the best, you know, environment for the kid. Next thing you know, it's like a uh, local politician. She Chiefs department, uh, uh, v- criminal things that are like less than ten thousand dollars to less than fifty thousand dollars suggest. Here's your judge now. It's beep boop. It's on your phone. Yeah. I just downloaded it to you. You're not guilty. Get out of here. It's like, oh yeah, perfect. Works for me. Thank you, thank you, AI. Uh, Larry, I got a question for you. Uh-huh. We're in the distant future. You're on the hot seat. Now there is a law that says, hey, you can't drive. Period. You know that motorcycle you want to go out on the road? You, no, they're all electronic vehicles now. You can get on your motorcycle, but it will drive you where you want it to go. You're just on. You're literally there for the ride. You're not 
driving anymore. Driving is a foreign concept. It's too dangerous. We value human lives. AIs know the network. They will make sure there will never be a car accident again. And for like for the last 10 years, there's never been a single car accident period. Like, would you be okay with that world? Or would you, you and your own rebel mindset still try to find some weird town or desert where you can be like, I still want to drive my right. vehicle. Right, yeah. I don't, I, don't think I'd like to, <laughs> I don't think I'd like to drive an automatic uh, computer-controlled motorcycle where I just ride along on top of it. No. Uh-huh. So. You don't want to do that? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I mean, imagine your AI-controlled motorcycle hits a sand patch. No, it's curve. perfect. It's perfect. No, it's, it's, perfect. Perfect. it's perfect. Yeah, it's yeah. perfect. It, there hasn't been a car accident in the last 10 years. Like, that is completely fallen off the map as one of the leading causes of death not a problem you're saying hey you can say motorcycle take me 100 miles an hour and it'll be like routing and then it'll just take you 100 th- miles an hour through school areas because it knows where the kids are and it's like we'll just make sure you go around them it's all good you wouldn't want to do that it's uh, way more fun so. 38 38,000 people die every year in the united states because humans drive cars right 98 percent of all crashes are human related it's human failure it's you guys got a transportation engineer on the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about <laughs> this traffic. Is this is my life, like, for the next 30 years, for sure. We are, uh, Scott, I think your estimate's low, but I think we are going to be, in the next 30 years, we're going to have this figured out. Cars are going to communicate with each other, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure. It's going to know the temperature of the pavement. It's going to know how fast it can take As long a as they don't follow each other like off a cliff or something. <laughs> well, well, but, <laughs> like I mean, lemmings. <laughs> listen, the, 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 thought of, the thought of these vehicles going up and down the hills in San Francisco is truly frightening to me. Have <laughs> you ever I seen a human drive? Yeah, but see, humans are a lot scarier. I, I think it's wrong at first. I'm Fire looking forward to drum? the future where robots are like, hey, we got this. But I want yeah. to see, you know, the third wave before it's like, okay, I'm going to get one too. I want everyone want to like yeah. slowly integrate it um i will say this i think it's kind of cool final points uh, a lot of the conversations that we're having now are very similar to the conversations we were having about chess You're on camera. when when ais are learning how to play chess and if you ever play enough chess you'll know like there's really three stages in chess there's the early game there's the mid game and then there's the end game the end game all mathematical there's like one solution to solve that an opening there are a lot of different openings you can use, but for the most part, they are well known in terms of their strength, what the best and what aren't the best. But the mid game is where the real players shine because that's when you start to make gambles on, I think I can make this move without you noticing I'm about to do this move, or I'm going to do this move. It may not be the best move, but it's the best move against you. Like I'm playing the player during the mid game. And a lot of people thought computers can't do that. Computers, no way can figure that out. They did. Yeah, they did. And not only that, but they're prob- they're obviously Better. now, the best players in chess period there used to be a time where it was a laughable concept and now it's just like no they they know how to do this way better than us they can be imaginative they can come up with new gambles larry what do you think well no i think that they they can learn pretty much any game that humans can and beat us at it eventually yep now i had we have very little time left and i wanted to ask one question and i'll just make it a yes or no question to everybody we don't have to go into reasoning because we have such little time when ai does become conscious do you think that they will put up with us or does, remember we mentioned skynet at the beginning do you think that they will get rid of us no immediately or do you think that they'll they'll abide with us i think they'll abide by us i think it'll be a we need each other sort of relationship and there's a lot of good value we can both offer i don't think humanity is so bad that we have to be destroyed to solve a problem i think we just need some curvature in terms of what we value and critical thought is going to be the thing that will be the key Go for it, George. I think they will put us in a museum. <laughs> we can go to the museum right now, George, if you want. <laughs> Scott, what do you think? Um, I think that that we're gonna have Neuralink, and so we're gonna pretty much team. If you can't beat them, join them. That's gonna be what actually yeah. happens. But I think we'll that the fear a, may Android. be irrational. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with I agree with Scott. Yeah, I, I think if if we're connected to them, then yeah, it'll be fine. But if if not, if we're kind of just taking it the way you set it up, Larry, um, I, I think we'll be treated more like animals, like ants. You know, I mean, we don't really worry about yeah. ants when we want to build a building. Yeah, their cognitive functions will be so much faster than ours. Yeah.
I don't think we'll. I don't think they'll have to wipe us out. I think they'll just scoot us over uh, to the side. I don't think they'll need what we need, and so I think there's just going to be like, hey, we can do all this. It's like, yeah, but we don't want the things that you're doing that for. We're not competing in terms of like a limited number of resources. Like, I think just we can coexist in a way where it's like, you want zeros and ones, and we want beer and <laughs> funny jokes. On Saturday night. <laughs> I think we can get along pretty good. <laughs> we don't need to be harmful good. to each other. Yeah, cool. Larry, go on and take us out. It's a good show. Great topic. Hey, this has been the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM from Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, my content uh, is on digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button. Uh, the radio show archives are there. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, either on Let's Chat or my channel, be sure to go like and subscribe. Uh, my book is called Atheism, What's It All About? It's available on Amazon. If you have any questions for the show, email them to askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org. If you're having trouble leaving religious beliefs behind, you can have a find out help at recoveringfromreligion.org. This has been the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life, and we'll see you next week. Say bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. See you next week. Good, good stuff, guys. <sighs> yeah, yeah, good show. Good.